Uh, we're calling this message, Rejoice Always. Rejoice Always. Now that comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. It's going to be our text where Paul admonishes us. And it's not Paul, it's the Lord who's speaking through Paul. Because this became scripture, and we're told that holy men of old wrote the scripture as was given to them by the Lord. So when Paul writes something and it's in the Bible, it is the word of God speaking to us. Here's what he says. He admonishes us. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So that's pretty clear. It's pretty black and white. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in everything give thanks. That is the will of God for every one of us. Now, before we go into that, and I want to try to break that down and look at it this morning, I want to remind us, and I probably keep doing this for the weeks to come, I want to remind us about the five characteristics or attributes of a person who's growing into maturity in Christ. And the reason why we're naming these attributes and talking about them is not to make anyone feel like, Oh my, I think I fall short. That's not the purpose. The purpose is to give us a map of where we're going. Yes. Give us a picture of where God is going to take us. We agree with that? Yes. So when we talk about abiding, unbroken, abiding in love, don't say, oh, I'm not there yet. Say this, God's taking me there. Amen. See, that's God's will for us. All through the Bible, and again, I'm not going to go through it, but all through the Bible in the New Testament, the goal of our faith of Christianity is to bring every single believer into the image of Jesus Christ. And yet, sadly, not every believer will be brought into that because it takes our faith and cooperation. And if people don't believe it's possible, they won't go there. And um, that's why the traditions of man, Jesus said, can make the word of God of no effect. Traditions have to fall by the wayside. The word of God is preeminent. We see things like this in Ephesians 4. God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry until we all come, grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we grow up in all things into the head. So it says all believers are to grow up into the full stature of Christ. Agreed? Amen. How many are still here this morning? Yes. Somebody smile like you believe it. Yes. All right. So he said we're, we're all called. Colossians 1.28. Three times in the verse, every man, every man, every man. Amen. Watch. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Yes. Perfect means fully mature, lacking no component. And again, on and on and on, we're told that in traditional American hybrid Christianity, which is not gospel Christianity, we were taught either not directly but indirectly, oh, nobody can be perfect. And nobody can grow up to full maturity. God knows we're all weak and just do your best and the grace of God covers us. That's a false gospel message that needs to be uprooted and discarded. The real gospel is the grace of God to transform us. And if you can understand it and grasp it, you'll thank God later. On judgment day, you'll thank God. You'll say, Lord, thank you that I got the real gospel. I was able to believe and trust you for your grace. I was able to cooperate with you so that you could have your way and form me into the image of Christ. That's the goal. So there's five distinctives. I'll say them real quick. Number one, and these aren't in any particular order, but these are qualities of someone who's mature in Christ. And we're all in process. Yes. Say, everyone say, I'm in process. I'm in process. One, they walk in and they abide in the love of God. God is love. He that abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. We'll, we'll come back to that no, another week. Number two, they're peacemakers. They've learned to be at peace with God and to live in the peace of God and to pursue peace. They've learned that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
So the other attribute about someone that's mature in the spirit is they have the peace of God. Peace. Okay, number three, they've learned to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. It has become a part of their lifestyle. That's what a mature Christian is. Now, we're all in process. So don't say, oh, I'm not there yet. Say, okay, that's awesome. God's going to take me there. He will. Uh, Number four, through prayer, studying the word, they've discovered the perfect will of God for their own life, and they're walking in it, and they're fruitful in the works that God has ordained for them to walk in. Now, Rick Joyner, I've heard him say this before. He's taken polls, uh, unofficial surveys at different conferences or meetings he's been at and asked people, how many people know what your calling is, at least for this season, what you're to be doing. He said only about 5% of the people seem to know. So that's a travesty. So that means it's impossible for people to fulfill their destiny. Now, knowing God's will doesn't mean that you know everything about your life for the next 50 years. It, It may mean that God just shows you for this month or this year or this season in your life, but you do know it you got your hand to the plow and you're about the Father's business. See, every believer needs to get that down. I've talked about that for the last couple weeks. So knowing the will of God and doing it. And then fifthly, the other attribute of someone that's mature, growing into maturity in Christ, is they've learned humility. They've learned that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And they've learned that the only way to ever become and do what God called us to become and do is by His grace. They've learned it's the only way is by His grace. And therefore, they've learned how to be humble and give God all the glory for everything good because only by grace can we become what we're called to be. Those are five attributes. Now, I'm saying that so that we can be aware of it. Now, when when we're aware of these attributes, then we can aim toward it. See, if if I'm not aware that a mature Christian has learned how to rejoice always and has unceasing prayer coming out of their life. And in every circumstance, they've learned how to give thanks. If I'm not aware, oh, that's what maturity is, then I don't know how to go for it. Okay? So that's why we're saying these things. So these are, this is the big picture. We need to have the big picture. <clears throat> it's a, we're getting a vision of what we're going to grow into. Now I'm going to say these two verses again to encourage you. And I pray that everyone that hears my voice, that these verses will become so real to you, they'll become part of who you are. Here's one of them, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. I pray that right now your ears can hear the word of God. It says, now may the God of peace. Now means now. Doesn't mean in the next life. Means now. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body. Now, after you're sanctified completely, he said your spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. In case you have any doubt, the next verse says, faithful is he that calls you. He also will do it. I want somebody to believe that. I want you to believe that. Because if you don't believe it, you'll faint along the way. Because what will happen is if you even try to live a fully surrendered, consecrated, holy life, I want to be transformed. What will happen if you don't believe this, you'll do it relying on self. And you'll end up in a place of despair. You'll find out this is not working very well. This is why people make up the doctrines of men. They don't have faith, and so they ascribe, they make up another doctrine. It's it's a lie. They said, well, I tried. and No, you didn't know how to do it by faith. Jesus said, uh, he appeared to Paul, he said, uh, for this reason, to make you a minister of the gospel, to turn people from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those that are sanctified by faith in me. So we're sanctified by faith. It's by looking, it's by promise, trusting in the, of course it takes our cooperation. If I believe, I say, Lord, do it to me. And I start taking steps of faith toward it. 
But while I'm working toward it, he's working in. Yes. He works in both to will and to do. Amen. And so if that faith is not there, you say, well, I can't forgive. I can't have that kind of love. You'll never go there. We have to believe Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can forgive. I can turn the other cheek. I can go the second mile. I can learn how to pray. I can be filled with the Holy Spirit. I can live in peace. I can walk in the Spirit. I can overcome anger. I can overcome lust. I can overcome selfish ambition. I can die to self. I can abide in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who lives in me. So you have to believe that. You have to get this verse down in your heart. The other verse is Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect in every good work, working in you what's well-pleasing in his sight, to do his will. He does it through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. And ever, amen. So God is now saying in the book of Hebrews, I will be the one that makes you perfect. I'll make you complete and whole in every good work. Now, every good work God calls you to is different than the ones he calls me to. But God has books, he, books written about your life. Ephesians 2.10, you are his workmanship, created for good works that he's foreordained. So don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Just find out what God has for you to do and do it. Because on Judgment Day, God's not going to open up Reinhard Bonnke's book and then and say, hey, you didn't do what he did. He's, he preached to more, that's not my calling. He's going to open up my book. And he's going to compare my walk with what he wrote about me. He's going to do the same for you. So God's going to make you perfect in the works that he's ordained for you. And you're the perfect person to do those works. Yes, you are. You are the perfect man or the woman for the job. You're perfect. Isn't that amazing? Uh, God, your personality, your background, your experience, your calling, your anointing, your gifting, you're perfect for what God made you to do. And God is infinitely multidimensional. And he's going to glorify his son through his body. And he's going to manifest his glory and beauty in infinitely multidimensional ways through all the members of his body. And you're one of them. Come on. So, so So you need to have that right up front. When we talk about this, Don't, if you catch yourself going, I'm so far from that, cast those thoughts down and say, I've read the foundational doctrines manual. I'm a new creation. I can do all things through Christ. I'm his workmanship. He's going to sanctify me completely. Come on, somebody believe. So now let's go back. One of these, now where did I get this? I got it from studying the life of John Wesley. He's talked about, he brought sanctification by faith and growing up to full maturity was a, his life message that he brought into the church. And I think it needs to be recovered today. It needs to be recovered. It was recovered in his day, but we lost it since then. And um, so he noticed in his own life and in those who were mature around him that this, he said, this is a quality of people The ones that are abiding in Christ have this quality about them. They're rejoicing always. Prayer never stops. Now, that doesn't mean you're vocally praying. It means your heart is always to the Lord. You're giving. There's a combination of thanks and songs and tongues and hymns and intercessions, groanings, uh, silently, just silent, communion, worship, adoration, supplication, but your heart, even when you're occupied and you have to do things, your heart is always toward the Lord. Your heart is always it's where your treasure is. So the people that have, by the grace of God, are growing into maturity, this is a quality about them. They're rejoicing always. Prayer is just nonstop. 
You know, I was thinking about it early this morning as I'm meditating on this prayer. It, I, I just had this picture in my mind. Now, when I was a kid, we had a, a pet cat. And uh, I'm not that, that great about cats. If you have a cat, God bless everybody that has a cat. But we, we had a cat. I liked, I liked the cat we had. It was it lived a long time. We had this cat for a long time. But there was something about the cat. Whenever I'd petted it, I don't know if it did all the time, but it seemed like when I got close, I could always hear that, that like all the time. There's just, and that's how it is when you're walking with the Lord. You may not be vocal, you may not be shouting, but it's just, it's just always going. How many know what I'm talking about? And, and so that's the believer. Your heart just gets connected and, and connected in your heart. How many know, you're, how many woke up in the middle of the night, you're praying in the spirit? Your mind's not even engaged, but your spirit man's going. Brrr. So that's part of it. Now, what we want to look at today is this phrase, rejoice always, and I'm kind of mingle it in with the other one, give thanks in all circumstances, or in everything, give thanks. Now, they kind of blend together. They're separate. Another week, I'll talk more about giving thanks in all circumstances. That has to do with trusting the sovereignty of God. But I want to talk about rejoicing always. Now, Paul received his gospel directly from the Lord. If you read in, the, in his writings, he'll say, I received from the Lord, and he tells all about the Last Supper as if he was there. The Lord took the cup. This is what he did. Like, Paul, you weren't even there. He said, I received it from the Lord. He received visions and revelations, encounters from the Lord. All the... He wrote more of the New Testament than any other man, including the, the, the others of the original 12 that walked with him. One fell, the son of perdition. But those 11 that stayed with the Lord, he wrote, he had as much or more revelation than all of them. He got directly from the Lord. In fact, he says in the book of Galatians, after so many years, I went up to Jerusalem and I met the pillars, Peter, James, and John, and I laid out the gospel that I preached with theirs to compare. He said, they could add nothing to me. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So Paul got all of his by direct revelation from Jesus. So when Paul, now how many know Paul was walking in the spirit? I mean, he's, the, the, the things he wrote are just jam packed with heavenly revelation. So this is a commandment now from the Lord. How many believe Paul knows what it, how to walk in the spirit? So now it's Paul writing it, but it's the Spirit giving it to Paul. It's a command. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, I got to tell you, I'm looking at that and I'm saying, you know, I'm not at the place yet where I'm rejoicing always. I want to be. I'm determined to go there. I do rejoice. I have the joy of the Lord. I have the peace of God. I feel the grace. And that's all by God's grace. I'm not anything except I'm nothing except a recipient of grace. But I have his joy. I have his peace. I know his presence. I do rejoice in the Lord. But I'm looking at it. I don't rejoice always. And that's a command. So my intention is I'm going to go there. The prank without ceasing, I think that's just happening. I, just, I can't turn it off. Who wants to, right? Now, giving thanks in all circumstances. Yeah, kind of, not always. But I'm looking at that and saying, Lord, take us there. Because this is where, by the way, has anyone told you lately, you've been marked by God to be an overcomer? Now, if you don't believe it, I'm going to tell you until you do. Come on. You've been marked by God to become an overcomer. You wouldn't be in this church if he hadn't have done that. If, you're, if that's not your desire of your heart and the calling of God in your life, this church will irritate you and frustrate you. You'll say, this is too demanding, too hard, too long. The, all that stuff. You won't like it and you'll leave. 
But if you're still here, as long as you've been, that's proof you're marked by God. Because that's, that's the grace of God that's been put on my life. It's for me, he's given me grace to run the race and call people to it. That's our calling. And I'm so glad that God connected us. I'm telling you, it's the greatest thing is to be around other people that love God. Isn't it? It's the greatest thing. I'm telling you, the longer I've been saved, the more I look at people that love God. I just see them as absolute treasures. The longer I live, I feel like God, the, I, un, I understand a little bit what God must feel toward people that really love him that are going after him. I'm telling you, these are gems, and you're one of them. Amen. So never let up or back up or give up or shut up, but stay up and pray up. Amen. 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 And God's going to show up and the devil's going to blow up. And then only after that, we're going to go up. <clears throat> now rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. How many want to go there? How many, how many would pray? Let's pray it right now. How many would say, Lord, I want you to work that in me. I want to become a person who's learned how to rejoice all the time. I want to become a person whose prayer never turns off. I want to become a person that's learned how to give you thanks in every circumstance. Lord, we want to grow up into the head. We want to grow up in all things in Christ. Take us there. Now, here's a question. How can someone rejoice always? Number one, make the decision. I want to be that person. Now, it's part of pursuing love. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, we're commanded, pursue love. Yes. Meaning, the Holy Spirit's in us, and His love is in our heart. But He's saying, pursue growing in love. Yes. Grow in love for God, love for people. Pursue it. If we're going to be on the road to maturity, we're always going to pursue more love. Yes, now, that means loving God. What is loving God? 1 John 5, 3 says, this is the love of God to keep his commandments. So in our pursuit of loving God, one of his commandments is rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks all the time. So because we love God, we want to keep his word. So say, Lord, do it to me. I want to become the man or the woman you called me to be. So number one, make the, that decision. Number two, study the Bible. Learn about rejoicing. Learn about, learn from others that are ahead of us. Then number three, start applying what we're learning. And number four, keep practicing until you're good at it. And that's how we're going to become overcomers. All with our confidence in the grace of God. So now the word, the, the word rejoice, simple definition, it means to be glad or exceedingly glad. Now, most of us can't just tell our emotions what to do, right? Yes, yes, emotions right. can come and go, but we can tell our will what to do. Yes. So when God commands rejoice, he's not saying, I command you to feel. He said, I'm commanding you to choose. There's a big difference. And so we understand. So that's the first thing. So Let's read Philippians 4, verse 4. We're going to get some insights into how we're going to grow into this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. By the way, Paul wrote this while he was in prison. He's in prison behind bars, and he's, he's so full of joy and rejoicing, he's writing letters to encourage the, the saints outside that aren't in prison. See, we do the opposite. We're outside. We say, we better go to jail and encourage them. He's in jail encouraging others because he has the joy of the Lord. Yes. Wow. And then he says, let your gentleness be made known to all. The Lord is at hand. Now, the word gentleness in uh, King James is moderate, moderation. What it means is even-temperedness. Even-temperedness. 
you know, fly off and get angry. Some people, we, we're, we're up and then we're down. Things are going our way. Hey, things turn around. We're, we're down in the dump. He said, don't do that. Be even tempered. So some translate it gentle. Some say moderation. But I think that's the best description of it. Be that way. Now he's going to tell us how to get the peace of God and put our mind where it's supposed. This is all connected to, he just said, rejoice always. So he's going to give us a clue how to do it. Uh, in the Philippians 4, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The peace of God, that, which passes, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we've talked about this before. If we're going to rejoice always, one of the first things we have to do is be sensitive to what's going on in our heart. One of the ways that we rejoice, everyone look at me for a moment. How do we do it? He said, be anxious for nothing. You can't be anxious and rejoice at the same time. Amen. Now, a lot of us, I think all of us are good at this, but we need to undo it. I think uh, we've learned, maybe subconsciously, to carry stress and anxiety and not even really be that aware of it. And uh, we just carry it. And when we do that, our heart is encumbered and we're not able to do what we're supposed to do. There's a reason he said rejoice always. We're going to find out more as we go into the message. It keeps us in the spirit. So the first thing is we have to become aware of what's going on in our heart. Are you stressed? Are you carrying stress? Are you, are you anxious about, is it relationship tension? Is it finances? Is it health? Is it all of those? Is it perfect? If it is, don't carry it around. You're not going to rejoice. So you've got to be sensitive. That's why we have to have a daily, quiet, devotional time every day and connect real strong with the Lord. And part of that is to be quiet and find out what's going in your heart. Just get quiet. And to say, oh, I realize I'm really stressed about this. Now you have to unburden your heart. Lay, just pour your heart out at the feet of Jesus. But don't stop there. Now you have to exercise faith. You have to start giving thanks by faith for the answer before you see it. It's not enough to pour your heart out. Because that's all you do and there's not faith mixed with it. Then you'll go to someone else and pour it out to them. You'll still be anxious. When you go to prayer, you should get up from prayer with your heart unburdened. Say, I left it at the feet of Jesus. You have to use faith. You say, I'm thanking God for the answer. I can't see the answer, but God's faithful. So that's very important. Listen, what we're, in, we're in school right now because you're being made into an overcomer. To carry the glory in the last days. To have peace when people around you don't. There's an old poem. I, did I mention this by Rudyard Kipling called If? We had to memorize it in eighth grade. Anybody memorize that poem? If you can keep your head when those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. And it goes on, if you, if you, if, 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 if. And at the end it says, then my son, you'll be a man. You know, and think of that. If you can keep your head when those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. We have to walk in the peace of God if we're going to rejoice all the time. So that's the first thing. Then he says, think about. Now this has to do with rejoicing. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. Meditate means hold it in your heart, think about it, turn it over in your mind, ponder it. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. So this is his, now before he said all this, he said rejoice. So what he's telling us is how to get our heart in a place where we can rejoice. Get the anxiety out, get faith in, and then start thinking about the right things. Amen. Come on. Amen. 
Now, whatever's true, lovely, noble, virtuous, of good report, we all have choices all day long what we're going to think about, and we have to become aware of what's going through our mind. Yes. It's by, in Romans uh, chapter 8, it says, the man who walks carnally has his mind on carnal things. But the man who walks in the Spirit has his mind on the things of the Spirit. So what our mind... Now listen, you're born again, the kingdom's inside you, but the kingdom doesn't manifest until our mind agrees with the Spirit. When our thought life agrees with the thoughts of the Lord, then we're what we can walk. That's what it says. They that walk in the Spirit have their mind there. So Paul said, think about the right things. So that means when you get home after a long day, and Melinda and I do this, I like to watch Sid Roth. I like to watch, if, depending on how tired I am, they have the short ones, the supernatural stories, they're 10 or 12 minutes. Then they have the 28 minute ones. I like to go through those and hear those. I get edified. It makes me think about the right things. I get built up. I, I start having a hallelujah shout right in my living room. I do. Oh, glory to God. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. Or you can watch AGT. America's Got Talent. Or you can watch. That's what everybody calls it, right? And it's, it's hit and miss. There might be a Christian on there singing, and they do sometimes. But then you get some ones, and they're, they're dressed like they just came from a stripper bar, and they're foul, and it pollutes your spirit. Turn it off. So what we think about is up to us what we put in. I do watch the news, but I watch it very little. I mean, just quickly. I'll just watch, seriously, not, not more than usually five minutes. I don't want to be filled with that. I kind of want to know, a little touch, what's going on. Okay, Israel's at war. What's going on? What's going on? I turn it off. Because what you think about is where, if we think about the natural, we walk in the natural. If we think about the spirit, we walk in the spirit. So the key of rejoicing and giving thanks all the time is, is, it's a commandment from God to keep us in the Spirit. Well, that's what overcomers do, right? Now, another key to rejoicing, I've touched on this before, is, um, is keep growing in the love walk because joy is a byproduct of walking in love. So if we allow anything in our heart that's not the love of God, it quenches the joy of the Holy Spirit. Now my understanding of, of the joy of the Lord is, is the Lord inside you is joyful. And you feel His joy. It's the joy of the Lord. When I feel the joy, it's not my joy, it's the joy of the Spirit. So when we're doing what we ought to, when we're forgiving and loving, and we're walking in love, we're pursuing that, the Holy Spirit will be inside you smiling. And you'll feel His joy. And His joy is your strength. Amen. So we have to be sensitive to Him. Wherever you go, you're taking Him. Whatever you talk about, you're making Him listen to it. Whatever you look at, you're making Him look at. So live in such a way to keep Him joyful. And the way that we do that is we love one another. Yes, Jesus said in John 15, verse uh, 9, As my Father loved me, I've also loved you. Abide or remain in my love. How, Lord? I'm glad you asked. If you keep my commandments, you'll remain in my love. Just as I've kept my Father's commandments, and I remain in his love. Then he says, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and your joy may be full. So now we look at a couple of things. If I'm going to rejoice always, first I got to make up my mind, that's where I want to go. Yes. I got to get a vision of it. And I got to start taking steps toward it. Lord, make me that man. Make me that woman Amen. that rejoices all the time. Yes, then I understand, I can't have a burdened heart. I got to cast all my cares on him. Yes, and then I, 
I have to understand, I need to just keep growing in love because he said, if I'll stay, keep his commandments, which is to love one another, if I keep growing in the love walk, his joy will remain in me. And his joy, our joy will be full. Now, the, the rejoicing believer that's walking in faith is the overcomer. Somebody say amen. amen. No, I'll just give you, I, I wrote down a few things to rejoice over. You know, when he said, think on these things, what's lovely, what's true, what's of good report, what's noble, what's virtuous. Think on these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Do you know what that means? When he says, the God of peace will be with you, it means God will crush your enemies under your feet. Yes. Romans 16, verse 19 and 20 says, uh, be excellent in what is good, be innocent in what is evil, and the God of peace will soon crush Satan's head under your feet. How's that for spiritual warfare? Watch. Didn't blow one shofar, didn't go on a march, didn't do anything, didn't map anything out, didn't find out the name of the territorial spirit. None of that's in, in there. What did it say? Be excellent in what's good, be innocent in what's evil, and the God of peace will crush Satan's head under your feet. I like that better than all the other strategies. Because I've seen people do them for decades and get no results. But if you become excellent in what's good and innocent in what's evil, the God of peace crushes Satan's head under your feet. Yes, Pastor. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, here's some things to thank God for. Are you ready? Where am I? There. Number one. Our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus. Because Christ is in us, we have the gift of eternal life. We're, oh, that's too quiet. You, you have to practice rejoicing in this. I'm sorry, you gotta stir up your mind. And, and, I, and we are new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. And and God is our Father. Yes. And we are no longer slaves to sin. Sin does not have dominion over us. Those chains have been broken. The old man is dead. We're under grace. Now, we should rejoice in that. Because when you rejoice in it, your faith goes through the roof. And if you don't rejoice in it, even though it's a reality, you won't walk in it. We walk in what we think about. That's why the command, rejoice in these things. Right? Here's another one. We are joint heirs of God with Christ. We inherit God. Come on. We have a compassionate high priest whoever lives to make intercession for us. The Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. He's with us to guide us into all truth. He's with us to teach us. He's, yes, he is. He's, he's with us to take the things of Jesus and reveal them to us. The Holy Spirit is working in our lives imparting grace. He's inspiring us, motivating us, instructing us, imparting to us, and empowering us to become and to do all that God called us to become and do. That's a reality. That's a reality. You are his workmanship. How's that for a praise? Everyone say, I am his workmanship. He's the potter. That's what God told Jeremiah. I believe it's in chapter 18. Uh, I don't know, verse 9 or something. He said, just as the clay is in the hands of the potter, so are you in my hands, says the Lord. Come on. I've never seen God make anything that wasn't awesome. You're in his hands. You're his workmanship. We have access to the throne of grace 24-7. Whatever we pray anything according to Scripture or according to His will, He hears us. And we have it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And God is causing all things. Listen, the things we don't understand, the things that make us cry, 
the things that break our heart, the things we can't figure out, God's using all of it for our good. Why? Because this light of, somebody needs to hear this, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us an exceedingly great and eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things that are seen for they're temporary, but we look by faith at the things that are unseen. That's something to rejoice about. We should rejoice over 1 Peter 5, 10. Now may the God of grace who called us to his eternal glory after you've suffered a while, he's going to perfect, strengthen, establish, and settle you. We should rejoice in that. Are you going through suffering? I'll come stand with you. But, and I know what it's like to have pain. I know what it's like to have tears roll down your cheek. I know what it's like to say, God, I don't understand. But I also know what it's like to come out of the other side of the fire and look back and say, God, you worked it all for good. And he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, so that we can say boldly, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see why we need to rejoice always? We need to get these things down, meditate. Paul said, meditate on these things. Think about them. Rejoice about them. Pray about them. Here's another good one. All the good works you've ever done that no one's seen, no one's acknowledged, it's all been recorded. If you've done something as small as give a Christian a cup of water, you will not lose your reward. Come on! That's awesome! Here's another one to rejoice over. God says, my thoughts toward you are more than the sands of the sea. There's another great one. As long as we seek first his kingdom. He didn't say, thank God he didn't say, as, as long as you're perfect. He said, as long as you seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, God will meet all your needs. It doesn't matter what happens in the economy. If you seek God first, you'll never lack. And here's another one to rejoice about. Jesus is coming back. And he's coming. <laughs> Come on! We shall behold him. Now give me some more time. I'm not done yet. I, I'm gonna, I want to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and talk about praising him when everything looks bad. Because praising, thanking, and rejoicing, they're all intermingled. It's hard to separate them. Right? I'm going to read fast, but you need to... 2 Chronicles chapter 20... Verse 1, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria. And they're, they're in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and he set himself to seek the Lord. That's the right thing to do. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together, asked help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, Now, what's going on? They're surrounded by enemies. They're outnumbered. Their fear grips their heart. They said, We need to seek God. We called a fast, called everybody together. And um, I'm telling you, this is going to be relived over again in America. America's going to find out when trouble comes, we better seek the Lord. When trouble comes, we better call a fast, get everybody, everybody together, begin to seek God. And he said, O oh Lord God of our fathers, you're, you are not God in heaven. Are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand, is there not power and might so that no one's able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel? And you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever. And they dwelt in it, and they built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple. We'll cry out to you. 
in our affliction, and you will hear us, and you will save. There's faith. And now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them, and they did not destroy them. Now they're here. They're rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you've given to us to inherit. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that's coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the son of Asaph, in the midst of the assembly. At least we know who he is now, right? The Spirit of God came upon Jehaziel. And here's what he said. Listen, all of you, Judah. Now the spirit of prophecy speaking. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem, you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord is with you. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed tomorrow. Go out against him, for the Lord is with you. Yes. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohothites and of the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they believed the prophecy. You see, nothing changed in the natural, but the word of the Lord came and they believed it. When they believed the word, they began to praise God. So they rose early in the morning, went out in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Joseph had stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. You shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. That's still true today. Don't believe everybody who says they're a prophet on the internet. Don't believe everybody who says, but when you've got seasoned uh, people with a track record that we know are really of the Lord, and you get two or three or four of them confirming the word of the Lord, believe it. Amen. God gives prophecy for a reason, so that we'll believe it and act on it. Don't be such a skeptic. You can use discernment. There's false ones out there. There's people that, they're wannabes. There's people that prophesy out of their imagination, but it's not hard to find the real ones. And when you find the real ones, believe them. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness. So they went out before the army and they were saying, now here's the direction God gave Jehoshaphat. He appointed, I love this, those who should sing to the Lord, who should praise the beauty of holiness, now, to me, I'm not making a big distinction between rejoicing and giving thanks and singing and praising. To me, it's all intermingled to there. He said they should go out before the army, and here's what they were saying. Praise the Lord, for His mercy endures forever. I'm telling you, that's faith. I mean, they're still surrounded. All they had was a, one prophet that stood up and prophesied. I'm with you. Don't have to fight. I'll give you victory. Go out there. They were so sure of it, they said, put the singers out first. Let's start just praising God for the victory right now. Thank you, Jesus. So they start praising God for the victory before they saw it. Now watch this. Please hear this. This is so important. Why does Paul, who walked with God as close as anybody, command us under the direction of the Holy Spirit... I want my people to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. Why would he say that? Because he wants us to walk in victory. This, this is a prophecy that came this morning. God said, breakthrough, breakthrough, break. This is it right here. Yeah. This message. Yeah. We have to apply it. We have to start thanking God and praising God when we don't see the answer. Right. Amen. I'm right. telling you the truth right now. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God will love you. If you don't have faith, He'll love you. He'll always love you. But you can't please Him without faith. Now watch this. Next verse. 
When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who'd come up against Judah, and they were defeated. Watch. God said, you don't have to fight. I want you to praise me. I want you to rejoice always and give thanks. They started praising the beauty of holiness. While they're praising, God said, great, I'll take care of them. He set ambushments. Watch what happened. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. So he made them turn against each other and fight each other. And when they'd made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, then they helped to destroy each other. There's three groups. Two groups came against one, destroyed them. Then the two turned against each other, destroyed each other. And all they're doing is hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the beauty of holiness. Now it gets better. So when Judah came to the place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were all their dead bodies fallen on the earth, and no one had escaped. That's a pretty good victory. It gets better. When Josephat and his people came to take away the spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering. How would you like to spend three days gathering gold and, and silver? And then you go, I can't carry anymore. He says, how was your day today? Oh, it was great. The enemy's defeated and I got more gold than I can carry. How did it happen? Well, we just decided to praise God anyway. We decided to give God the glory when everything looked horrible. Then they returned every man to Judah. And um, Joseph out in front of them. They went back to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. They came back with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of those around Israel when they heard what the Lord had fought against their enemies of Israel. So, so God gave them the joy, but they first had to praise him when there was no sign in the natural. Now let me read a couple of verses. I want to give you a testimony. Listen to what happened. There's something supernatural that happens when we rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances, when the natural doesn't look good. Jesus did it. He's teaching. He went out into the wilderness for three days. So a multitude follows 5,000 men. Now, one of the gospel accounts said that's just the men not counting women and children. There could have been 10 to 20,000 people. And they've now been with him three days in the wilderness. There's no food. And they, he, the disciples said, send them away. Jesus said, if I send them away, they'll faint. They haven't eaten for three days. You just tell me how anointed that teaching was when people follow him into the desert without eating for three days to, to hang on every word that came out of his mouth. He said, they'll faint if we send them away. Now, here's what he did. Well, we just said, what do you have? He knew what he was going to do. We said, I have a lad's lunch, just a few fish and loaves. Here's what he did. He said he lifted it up. Now, here's what we would have probably done. Maybe not you, because you're, but some people might have said, God, I can't believe it. You led me to come out here. You told me to come out in the desert. You told me to do this. I've done it. And now there's no food, and they're all going to faint. Why? Why did you do that? See, that's unbelief. Jesus is our example of what a man or a woman of faith looks like. It says he took what he had. He lifted up to heaven. It says he gave thanks. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this. Thank you. When we thank God, what we thank God for gets multiplied back to us. Amen. Then it multiplied. Now here's a scripture for it. Watch this. Psalm, uh, oh, oh, let me back. I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to read these verses about that. This is Psalm 67, verse 5. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. 
Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. Let the people praise you. Then the earth will give her increase and God will bless us. Here's another one, Jeremiah 30, 19. Then out of them shall proceed thanksgiving and the voice of those who make merry. That's rejoicing. I will multiply them and they shall not diminish. I will also glorify them. They shall not be small. So you see the principle through Scripture that when we thank God, His kingdom manifests. When we rejoice by faith, His kingdom manifests. Things are multiplied back to us. And I've told you this before. Back about a year before I got married, I received a prophetic word. that uh, I was told this, and honestly, I didn't understand. It was God said He's going to strip everything away from your life that you can trust in. And he's going to build in you a supernatural faith. You're not going to be shaken by these trials, but you're going to go from faith to faith and glory to glory. I didn't know exactly what that word meant, but about 90 days later, it all started coming to pass. Everything in my life that could go wrong started going wrong. I wrongfully lost my job, and I'm going to go into all the details. Uh, Investment went bad. My health went bad. Everything. It's that song that Mary, Mary... Remember that song? Take these shackles off my feet so I could dance. Anybody remember that song? What, like 20 years ago? There's a verse in there that said, everything that could go wrong all went wrong at one time. So much pressure fell on me, I thought I was going to lose my mind. But the chorus is, take these shackles off my feet so I could dance. So I'm telling you, we went through that. And, uh, And God taught us, we taught us how to live by faith, how to give by faith, how to praise him by faith. Yes. How to praise him when you're in pain. How to praise him when it doesn't look good. How to praise him when it looks like everything's going wrong. How to give thanks. And we watch God do miracle after miracle after miracle. And I'm telling you, this breakthrough message that was prophesied this morning, this is what we're going to have to learn to live. Yes. Amen. Yes. All of us in the days, we better get it under our belt now. We need to live now, praising him all the, we need to learn now how to rejoice always, pray constantly and give thanks and all. Learn now and to walk in the supernatural. We need to get it, uh, God's given us enough lead time to practice and get good at it. But I'll give you an example. In the early days, we were first married. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm telling you, we were in a hard place. And my, my oldest son is, I think, 36. Uh, he was an infant. And, um, and I lost my job and uh, my health. I didn't know what was wrong. I later went to doctor after doctor. And finances, like, it's like everything dried up. And I remember that word. I'm going to teach you to live by faith. So there's one day. Here I am. I got a, a little baby boy. I don't have money to buy formula or diapers. Our cupboard's almost empty. And I said, okay, this is it. We've got to walk by faith. And thank God he gave me a wife full of faith. She's full of faith. She's more than I am a lot of times. Her words, her confession, and her faith. She'll, she'll easily give away her last thing, and she'll do it over and over and over. She has no hesitation God will take care of her. And um, I love that. And so we were here, we're like, man, we need food. But we said, we know we're seeking God first. We both put God first in our life. We have a strong prayer life. And, and we know God's going to take care of us. So what are we going to do? I said, I told my wife, I said, we're going to rejoice. The Bible says rejoice always, pray without ceasing and give thanks. Now, one of the words for rejoice in the Old Testament is to spin like a top. So I told my wife, and I'm glad she didn't even, she didn't even hesitate. She said, all right. So we're standing at our apartment this end. You, some of you heard this, some haven't. That God is my witness. We did this. I said, all right, let's run back and forth through our apartment, and let's twirl around. And let, we're going to start rejoicing like this, and we're going to say, thank you, Lord. You meet all of our needs. We have no fear. You'll never leave us or forsake us. 
She, I said, she said, let's do it. So we took hands. The first time we skipped together and we started turning around and praising God, jumping up and down, shouting and saying, glory to God. Lord, you're such a good God. You've never forsaken us. You always meet our needs. We were running back and forth, twirling around like that. And after a while, after a while, you go like, all right, now it's time for a faith confession. So I told her, I'm going to the grocery store, and I'm coming back with groceries. Now I had, you see, the, now I don't know the exact amount, but it's probably about $1.32 in my pocket. No more than two bucks, if I remember correctly. But we needed about, now back then, $40 worth of groceries would buy about 200 today. So I remember I said, I'm going to the store, because we both knew about speaking by faith. That's why you need to get that book, Sanctify Your Tongue. And um, so we praised God. I said, you stay here. I said, I'll come back with formula, diapers, and groceries. I'm coming back. Got in the car. With my, drove over to Smith's Food King. Got out of the car. Got a basket. Started down the aisle looking for the baby formula and the diapers. I come around the corner and I bump into Janie Ferguson. I knew her husband played guitar in, in when we did outreaches and stuff. She said, oh, hi, Janie. Hi. She said, I heard Melinda had a baby. I said, oh, yeah, he's about a month old now. She said, oh, congratulations. I'm so, she opened up her purse, grabbed a big wad of cash. She goes, here, get some groceries. <laughs> I mean, I had, a, I had a big wad of cash like that. And I went down the aisle and filled my cart up like that. Zippity doo dah, zippity day. Now, I paid for all the things, had money left over in my pocket. I'd come home, I got my arm. Ding dong, I had to Melinda open it. I said, I'm home. Come on. That's how we have to live. I'm telling the truth. I'm not exaggerating. I'm, God is my witness. And um, I, I'm not saying that we do it perfect all the time, but we have to get this down. We live, we walk not by sight, we walk by faith. And when, when the transition went from Moses to Joshua, here's what he said. Not one good word of his promises has failed. That's right. Jeremiah, God says, I watch over my word to perform it. God is faithful. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not pass away. And we can live not by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We, this is our treasure. And we can live by faith in the word of God. And to, to live and move and walk in the spirit all of us, I do, you do, we need to get better. We need to make up our mind. I'm going to be a man or a woman that cultivates. Rejoice always. Pray without sin and give thanks in all circumstances. And I, again, I, because I know personally what it's like to have physical pain. For years, I've learned, even when it hurts, it's not... It's not, it's okay if your emotions don't feel like it. Let your will do it. Yes, amen. That's right. That's right. That's right. Even if you have tears, you can still lift your hand and say, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. And I love you, Lord. And I know that I don't know how this can work for good, but I still believe it is. And I give you the glory and start praising him. And I'll tell you what will happen if you'll start the Holy Spirit will come in. Yeah. And he'll start filling your heart with joy and faith. And he'll help you because that's what he does. Somebody say amen. amen. Now I want to give you... Now don't shut me down. Give me five more minutes to finish this. When... I want you to see this. By the way, I wonder where Paul and Silas learned in Acts 16 when they were beaten with many stripes and thrown in prison. Where did they learn to start praising God? I believe they learned it 
from the Lord. Paul got his gospel directly from the Lord. That's what Jesus, how Jesus lived. You know, the night before Jesus was crucified, the night he was betrayed, after the Last Supper, do you know what the Bible says? After the Last Supper, it says they went out and sang hymns. Are you telling me? I mean, he knows he's about to have his back beaten to sh- shreds, his beard plucked out, covered with spit, and nailed to a cross. And he said, come on, let's go out and sing a hymn. That's what they did. That's what they did. And by the way, talking about Mother's Day, Jesus is on the cross. He wasn't saying, John the Beloved was there. Mary was there. Right? He didn't say, John, pray for me. This is really hard. He didn't say that. He said, Mary. He was thinking about her. Behold your son. John, behold your mother. He was thinking, she's so undone because I'm not going to be around. So he's comforting her. Here's a son that will take care of you. Oh my God, what an awesome Savior we have. Now, one more thing about praise. Should I do this? Yeah, I need to finish it. So just give me five more minutes. In Matthew 21, Jesus went to the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it's written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them all. And that's exactly what's going to happen when churches become houses of prayer. When the churches become houses of prayer, I'm talking to everybody, you're going to see the power of God. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, have you never read? And he quoted to them from Psalm 8, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have perfected praise. The word perfected means you've prepared and made it complete. So he said, have you never read? But what's interesting is, let me go back to what page is that? What's interesting is in, he's quoting Psalm 8. Let me read Psalm 8. It says, verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Now let me keep going. Because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. The word silence means make to cease and stop activity or to paralyze. Now listen, he's quoting when he said, out of the mouths of babes you perfected praise, right? Yes. But when he, he was quoting that from Psalm 8, where it says, out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you've ordained strength. Now why did he ordain strength? Because of your enemies, that you may silence or paralyze the enemy and the avenger. Now, does Jesus have the right to interpret Scripture? I guess since he's the living word. So he interprets ordaining strength as perfecting praise. When he quotes it, he quotes it word for word, except as strength, he says praise. You've ordained praise. What's he saying? Praise makes us strong in the Lord. And he said, why did God ordain praise? He said, because of your enemies, to silence them and paralyze them. What happened in 2 Chronicles 20? When they began to praise the Lord, their enemies were defeated. Now Psalm 8 says, God has ordained praise. Here it says strength. He's ordained us to become strong. But Jesus is saying the way we become strong is from praise. Yes. So when we give God our praise, God goes into action and paralyzes the enemy. That's exactly right. Somebody lift your hands and shout amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's what happened in Acts 16 when they begin to worship God and praise the Lord. 
All of a sudden, there was an earthquake. The prisons were opened. They got set free. Their chains fell. What happened? The enemy who'd cast them into prison. If you go back, they were on their way to Philippi. A demon-possessed girl, possessed with the spirit of Python, was prophesying. It bothered his spirit. He turned around, cast the demon out. When he did, he engaged the regional spirits. So a mob was stirred up, and they were thrown into prison. So because of their enemies, they begin to praise God. God's, now, I, when the earthquake happened, I believe it's because the angels came. Because the Bible says at the resurrection, when an angel came to the tomb, there was an earthquake. When they landed, bam, the earth shook. So there, that's it. I'm kidding you. So they're praising God. God says, well, God, God to paralyze their enemies now. Go, boys. And the angels come down. Bam, the doors open up. The chains fall off. Everything's turned around because of praise. So this is the breakthrough that we have to cultivate. We have to cultivate the faith to rejoice always. The, the faith to give thanks in all circumstances. God's ordained it. When we have a praise service like we did today, I guarantee you the powers of darkness are paralyzed. It causes shock waves to go in the spirit realm. It causes fear. I'm, the demons are texting each other. Get out of Lancaster. The, <laughs> Shekinah started their praise service again, you know. Uh, now listen, you can have it right in your house. Right in your, every day. Let's pray. Lord, we're asking you for the grace. Lord, make us those people. Help us to grow into this. Lord, help us to practice it. Remind us, Lord. There's no condemnation if we're not doing it right. But Lord, your grace is with us. Lord, we're in overcomer school. Lord, you're raising up people that are going to learn how to rejoice all the time. Praise you in their pain. Praise you through difficult circumstances. Lord, make us that people. Lord, help us to see the blessings. Help us to walk by faith. Give us the grace, Lord. Lord, the world needs your presence. Yes. They need victory. Amen. Lord, make us carriers of your victory. Make us carriers of your victory. We ask it in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Come on, let's all give God praise.